Well, hey there, everybody. I'm Corey Bratta here, Iowa Hawkeyes Live 126, voice of college football. I'm uh, kind of filling in as the uh, host this evening on the Hi Iowa channel. So uh, for everybody who's going to be uh, filtering in here in the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes, thank you for ending your work day with the voice of college football and myself. Of course, I am, as you can see behind me, my logo from the Hawkeye of the Storm. We're both on YouTube, this is also uh, going to be podcasted via from the Hawkeye of the Storm on Spotify, Apple, Google, etc. And we are counting down the days to the Citrus Bowl as the Hawkeyes are, I believe, in route or may have already landed down in Orlando. I did see that earlier today that uh, the Iowa football team is in route. Brian Ferentz is a part of that trip down there. There was some speculation that perhaps he would not attend. Perhaps he would not be a part of the bowl game and somebody else would be calling plays if he had some type of a job offer. And that does not appear to be the case. So uh, the Hawkeyes will uh, face off against the Tennessee volunteers down at the citrus bowl next Monday. That's new year's day. Um, and a nationally televised game for the Hawkeyes to potentially hit 11 wins. And as Kirk Ferentz has talked about, that is a special, special achievement. If you can do it. I know a lot of Iowa fans would love to see this game treated more like an audition and, uh, you know, maybe get some younger guys in there, especially at the quarterback position, maybe a Marco Linez. I have been very plain in how I feel about that. I think it's an abs absolutely a fair um, want, a, a fair uh, um, idea. I don't think it's unfair by any means, but uh, do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. Boy, it'd be nice, though. Of course, Iowa fans also concerned with the future of the offense with a different offensive coordinator at the helm. So, uh, you know, that's a, a storyline we'll continue to follow. If you missed the podcast I released last night, you can check it out over at my channel. Search from the Hawkeye of the Storm on YouTube. And uh, I had a well, actually a great show. It was with uh, 2024 kicker Trip Woody, who is now a part of the Swarm in 2024. But I also gave my two cents for 10, 15 minutes just about the offensive coordinator position, the three names that have been tossed out there, and rightfully so, the three names that are actually legitimate names that are potential candidates for this job. I shouldn't say potential, that are candidates for the job. I really only think two of those three have a legitimate chance, and one of the three has a much greater chance than the second one, if that makes sense. Um, but I gave my two cents on all three of them, and then I mentioned there's a third candidate who would shock a lot of people and um, boy, Kirk and Iowa, they're not letting that information uh, slip out. So there have been some erroneous reports about Kirk Ferentz offering the job to certain people. Uh, those are simply not true. He has not offered the job to anyone. And my understanding is he is still going to be after the bowl game. My understanding is he's likely going to be visiting um, a candidate in person in a different part of the country. So that's what I know. But uh, we're here for the next 45 minutes or so talking Iowa Hawkeye football as uh, Mark Rogers taking a uh, well-deserved hiatus with some family this week. So uh, we'll try to fill in for him admirably. Appreciate everybody being here in the chat so far. Throw up your questions, your comments in the chat. Certainly a super chat would be appreciated. But if you have any questions regarding football or certainly regarding uh, the hiring process for Kirk Ferentz, I'll try to answer those questions as best I can. Um, I do see uh, some early banter, and, and one of the big storylines that came out of yesterday is that uh, I can confirm through Brad Heinrichs of The Swarm. Uh, I know he posted this to a different, couple of different places, and I talked with Brad personally last night about it. Um, Nick Jackson has had his waiver approved by the NCAA. Now, what that means, if you missed some of my coverage on this matter earlier in the month, what that means is is that he can come back if he so chooses. In other words, Virginia cut their season short in 2022 due to the unfortunate campus shooting, on-campus shooting that occurred there down at Virginia. And so the seniors were immediately made eligible to return for an extra year. Decisions were not made on underclassmen. Nick Jackson, some of Nick Jackson's previous teammates had already announced they planned on returning. That announcement had not yet come from Nick. From what we had been told, from what I'd been told, Nick was waiting to get uh, an answer from the NCAA. He wanted to know if it was even possible to do this. He has since been told, yes, he is eligible for an extra year. All right. And that is fabulous news. If Iowa can get Jay Higgins and Nick Jackson back next year, wow. 
Uh, what a foundational couple of pieces for that defense. And you think about the guys right behind him, Xavier Wampa. Uh, Sebastian Castro has an opportunity to return as well. He's, of course, mixed in as a, a cash. We have not gotten decisions from Jamari Harris. Cooper DeGene has not made an announcement yet. That is coming. So lots of exciting things around the corner. And, you know, I, I think back to a year ago from now, and a year ago at this time we were talking about Cade McNamara joining the fray. I believe he had already committed to uh, Iowa out of the transfer portal. But we kept talking about how 2023 was an important year to make some significant offensive changes because 2024 with the new Big Ten was coming. And I don't back down from that stance at all. Um, 2024 is going to change a lot. Now you got Washington, Oregon joining USC and UCLA in the mix, in the scheduling mix. But, um, you know, I think we all said, hey, this is going to be, it's going to be harder to win 9, 10, 11 games at Iowa with the likes of those four teams out West. Doesn't mean Iowa's going to go, you know, five and seven, six and six on a regular basis, but nine and three, 10 and two are going to be a lot harder when you're not playing almost exclusively Big Ten West opponents. There are no divisions moving forward. Every Big Ten team is likely going to get at least two or three quote unquote marquee opponents in the Big Ten conference schedule year after year, in addition to their extra power five opponent that they schedule out of conference. So you know, that makes it that much more difficult. There's going to be balance, which is good for the conference. It's good for the sport. Ultimately, I think it's good for competitive fairness um, and equity, but it is going to be harder. Now, with that being said, if they bring out, if they bring back some fine foundational pieces like, you know, a Jay Higgins, a Cooper DeGene, a Nick Jackson, boy, you're, you're talking about a uh, pretty solid foundation and a defense that's absolutely would be, I mean, we, without even looking at the rest of the FBS, would have to be a preseason top 10 overall defense in the country. That might even be a little bit uh, unfair to Iowa because who would you be losing? You'd be losing Joe Evans, who's been a dog. Don't get me wrong. He's been fabulous. They lose Noah Shannon, who didn't play this year anyways because of the NCAA's blunders. And uh, you lose Logan Lee right? I'm probably missing somebody else. Um, Logan Lee, Joe Evans, and oh, you lose some guys to the transfer portal like Ontario Thompson, who really wasn't playing, had a couple of blocks on special teams on punt duties. But my point is like you're bringing almost everybody back on defense and now you're looking to upgrade your offense. New coach, um, Cade McNamara, healthy, we hope. Uh, Marco Linez is a year older. Hopefully he's ready to step in. If something were to happen with McNamara, that's a luxury they did not have this year. Deacon Hill came in, transferred from Wisconsin, and did what he did. But uh, certainly you'd hope that they'd be better behind Cade next year if something were to happen. And then you potentially get Luke Lachey back on offense, potentially. I do think Eric Hall is moving on. You're getting Caleb Brown, Seth Anderson back, and then a lot of experience behind Luke Lachey. Even though you lose Eric Hall, you get Addison Estringa, who played this year. Um, you would get uh, Zach Ortworth, who got some some time, got some run as a tight end. These tight ends are just put into – almost super speed, hyper speed at Iowa. And I saw a graphic, uh, my thoughts go out, my condolences go out to TJ Hawkinson, who apparently suffered a serious knee injury yesterday. Very unfortunate for him. And um, But my point is, this has been a tight end factory at Iowa, so you have confidence in that position. You hope the O-line continues to take steps forward. I was hoping we'd see a little bit more improvement collectively this year. But again, they bring a lot of guys back. I know people... A lot of people don't like Nick DeYoung because of some struggles he's had, but I think he's going to be an experienced, vital piece to a veteran line. And uh, you bring back Jennings Dunker. You bring back Logan Jones, who's not ready for the league. Mason Richmond ain't ready for the league. Just go down the list. A lot of experience they bring back next year. If you can convince four, five, six of those guys, you have scholarships available for four, five, six of those potential returnees. So, I know I'm rambling, but those are my two cents on the latest. Nick Jackson's return would be huge. And I'd been given indication here a couple of weeks ago that it was, it, it wouldn't surprise me based on the indication I've been given if Jay and Nick make a joint decision. They're very close. They're roommates. They're best friends. Um, I would not be shocked if either they both leave or they both come back. And as of right now, if you had to put a gun to my head, my prediction would be, I think they're both coming back. All right. But I'm not into the whole predicting what, well, I guess I am into the business of predicting what uh, teams are going to do in players. But uh, 
it's hard to predict because things change too, right? I mean, you're getting different draft evaluations. Same thing with Cooper DeGene. He's getting draft feedback. And uh, these kids don't have to announce right now, right? They're focused on the game just like the coaches are focused on uh, the game on this coming Monday. And uh, they'll go from there. Cole Stipulate, thank you for being here. Appreciate that. And as a reminder to everybody, if you're here, uh, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you've not already done so. From the Hawkeye of the Storm podcast is available. Uh, search on your favorite podcast platforms. We'll throw that up on the bottom of the screen for everybody as well. Jackson is here. Erica is here as well. She wants the shocker candidate as the next OC. William says, by shock candidate, does that mean good or bad? It would not be bad. It would not be bad. I think a lot of people would be really, 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 really excited about it. That's the indication I've been given, but uh, we'll see. And again, there's also a possibility that more candidates become available. It's almost a certainty that more candidates will become available. There are certain people a few weeks ago that look like they might be available for the position that are simply not now. Tim Polasek is a prime example. Former O-line coach here. He was the uh, offensive coordinator at North Dakota State, went to Wyoming. The head coach at Wyoming retires during the offseason. North Dakota State's head coach goes down to coach linebackers at USC. And all of a sudden, Tim Polisek's the new head coach at North Dakota State. So he's not an option for Iowa at offensive coordinator. I don't know that he would have been a great option anyways. Certainly, uh, the Bison administration thought he would be good for um, head coach up in uh, Fargo. Uh, John Diadamo is good here. Thank you, John. Appreciate you being here. And let's see here. Uh, Alan, thank you for being here as well. Steve says, anyone not related to Kirk Ferentz works for me. I can uh, I promise you that the next offensive coordinator, Steve, will not have the last name of Ferentz. And it's not going to be Tyler Barnes, Kirk's son-in-law. I think Tyler's done a pretty good job as a uh, recruiting coordinator. I think that's kind of what he's cut out to be. Uh, Rick says, as the backup, Marco is always one play away from next man in as far as youth goes. Deke is only a sophomore. Very true. He's got some mechanical things that uh, need to be cleaned up, and that's why you hope, hey, J John Budmeyer's presumably been working with these kids around the clock, and I think that's a bit of a concern if you start talking about the possibility of John continuing as your quarterback's coach. Have we seen the development out of the younger guys? Now, they have lost some people to the portal. They lose Joe Labus to the portal this month, but we also didn't see Joe Labus at least – from as, as far as how Iowa has evaluated the quarterbacks, and there's reason to question how Iowa evaluates quarterback play. We didn't see any improvement from Joe Labus because if we had seen improvement, if the coaching staff had felt like there had been significant improvement during the offseason, you would think Joe would have gotten a chance when Cade went down during the struggles of Deacon Hill, and we just didn't see him. So he transfers, he enters the portal, he has not made a decision on where he'll end up as of yet, and Marco Linez is really uh, just really young. But um, I believe that whoever they bring in as the OC needs to also coach quarterbacks, and um, that would help the cause immensely. They need help with the passing game right now. I don't think there's any question about it. Even though the O-line has struggled, I still have a lot of confidence in Kirk Ferentz as an O-line guy. Now, maybe that confidence, that uh, patience ought to be running out by now because of some of the struggles in recent time. But uh, I, I just have confidence in, in his pedigree as an O-line guy. All right, Casey? Very good uh, to see you here. Um, we'll see after next Sunday who the next OC is. Yeah, it may be a little bit of a delay. It won't be uh, Sunday, but we'll see after Monday, right? The game is on Monday. We'll see sometime after that. And uh, Jay is here as well. Thank you, Jay. The teams out West will not do well in the Big Ten. They don't have very good defenses. A good defense can stop them. Well, I think it's both ways, Jay. I think Mark talked about this a week ago. You could be right in some regards, and there are going to be struggles. They're not going to come in and dominate this conference, but I also don't think like Illinois, Iowa, Purdue, Minnesota are going to dominate Washington, Oregon, USC. All right, I think that's jumping the gun. I think there's got to be some balance there, and there are going to be games, I think, that you see struggles on both sides. Um, I think the Pac-12 was really good this year. I think it was maybe a little overrated early. We saw Colorado take a big jump in the first few games and then kind of subsided. Same thing with Wazoo. Uh, go down the list. Arizona had a huge bounce back year. Of course, Washington and Oregon were both phenomenal. USC took a step back. Um, but, I mean, overall, those four programs that are joining the fray next year are really good. And I do think that um, you look at Iowa, you know, the closest thing that we've seen to like a Washington or a USC in the Big Ten has been Ohio State. Now, you could argue Ohio State's been a much better defensive team. 
I mean, they weren't a couple of years ago, but they are now. Um, but I think if I was butt whooping at the hands of Ohio state a year ago. So, um, I mean, Iowa can beat teams that score a lot of points, but when you don't score a lot of points yourself against any level of defense, it's going to be hard to beat anyone that scores points. So that makes sense, right? That's uh, that's not hard math to do. So um, I think there's a balance there. I think there are going to be struggles each way. And uh, I think it's going to be a competitive year in the big 10. It should make the big 10 fun. It's just going to be hard to win nine, 10, 11 games unless you can somehow put up points. And they've been able to do that. I was managed to find a way to do that over the last three years without putting up points in part because of great head coaching, fabulous defense, fabulous special teams play. And then the fourth part, it, it is a fair estimation, whether you like it or not, a weak schedule almost every year. Now, last year, tougher schedule. There's a reason that they went seven and five. They went seven and five with a bad um, offense. You could argue that seven and five is still almost a miracle. They won almost every other close game that they needed to win minus Iowa State. They lost to Ohio State, lost to Michigan last year, lost a close one to Illinois, and then lost a stupid one to Nebraska in which Cooper DeGene went down and things just kind of spiraled out of control. But I mean, you could argue they were just a few plays away from, you know, being uh, nine and three uh, with that offense. And, uh, that's the difference having a, a couple of powers on the schedule makes. Again, moving forward, you're going to have two to three, if not more powers every single year. And I say powers, I'm talking USC, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, Wisconsin, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan. Just too many good teams in this conference. And then you're not taking into account, you know, does Nebraska take a big step forward? Uh, Minnesota and PJ Fleck just beat Iowa this year. They're always dangerous. Uh, what will Brett be? Will Brett Bielema just slink back into a kind of irrelevancy at, at uh, Illinois. I kind of doubt it. Northwestern went eight and five this year under a first year head coach, very difficult circumstances there in Evanston. So it's a fascinating race in the conference going to be a fascinating race without the divisions and just how everything gets leveled, balanced back out. Um, it's going to be difficult for the teams that were in the West. Uh, William says a week of January 9th will be the announcement as a college football uh, college football officially over non-playoff NFL teams done as well. Week of January 9th will be the announcement. Um, possibly, William? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is going to be, I don't think this offensive coordinator hire is going to be prolonged, but I do think Kirk has got to dot some other I's, cross some other T's. I don't think, based on what I've been told, I don't think he's made a decision right now. That's why it's almost humorous when you hear about these reports. Oh, so, you know, so-and-so is expected to get the job. Well, uh, that's news to Kirk. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll see. Now, Steve says any chance that Kirk retires after the game. I, I think that's slim and none and slim left town. I don't see, based on what I've been told, he's he's locked in. He is uh, prepared, and he wouldn't be all in on this offensive coordinator search if he was not all in moving forward. Um, let's see here. Uh, Robert, uh, or not Robert, I'm sorry. Where did I see Robert? I thought I saw Robert's name somewhere. Uh, if I missed it, I apologize. Tanner, here's one uh, a question from Tanner. Do you have a good idea of who has opted out for Tennessee? Haven't heard much about it. I know their top tailback is out, all right? I think they got a couple of DBs out. They have been affected. Let's just say this. They've been affected more so by the opt-outs and all that stuff, the, the portal, than Iowa has to this point. You think about Iowa, what Iowa's lost. They've lost Brendan Diaz-Fernandez. They've lost Joe Labus. They've lost Ontario Thompson, and I haven't talked about him yet on my channel, but Ontario is a loss moving forward, but he was not playing on defense this year. So, uh, I mean, who else am I missing right now? They lost Jackson Filer, legacy kid that transferred in with Ontario last year. He was not playing. And am I missing somebody else? Um, I don't think – I think I'm missing one other person here. Uh, let me find this uh, – last transfer portal uh loss but the, the the point is like they're no they they have not lost much in comparison to most teams uh let me see 2024 on on three their site uh Deontay Vines I'm sorry so Deontay Vines that's the name that was in my mind that I could not pull up uh, of course they lost Spencer Petrus as well he didn't play this year he was hurt it was kind of in a coaching role for Iowa so Deontay Vines is a loss it, how big of a loss ah I don't I don't know. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Deontay Vines. I think Caleb Brown earned his way ahead of Deontay Vines. And um, 
just in response to this, I, I did see some comments on social media of the video that we saw of Joe Labus throwing deep passes to uh, Deontay Vines in practice. L let's just remind everybody of one thing. Those are practice clips. Those are highlight. Uh, that's highlight film. So how many snaps is Joe Labus getting on a day in and day out basis, especially during fall camp? How many dozens of, of snaps? And you're seeing a compilation of maybe 10 clips all time from practice. Like he could have 10 really good highlights. Uh, Joe Labus may have 10 really good highlights where receivers are getting open and they're, they're throwing darts down the field. I can promise you that is not how practice is going each and every day. It's just not. There's a reason why Deontay Vines slash Joe Labus would opt to include that highlight film, just like watching huddle tape. That's why huddle tape, we always talk about that when evaluating recruits on this channel. Like I can't, first of all, I'm no analyst, and I especially cannot analyze uh, tape based on huddle film because they're highlights, right? Uh, I don't think a recruit's going to put his uh, – his bad highlights on film. So that's why coaches, any coach that says that they can figure out if a player is a D one athlete or a power five athlete based on five minutes of clip, uh, Don Patterson has said that's on, on my show before. That's absurd. Um, that's why coaches have to travel and see guys in person and have other coaches watch those players over multiple games. So uh, anyways, but I did see that video footage uh, of uh, vines and labus in practice. Double Trouble Dad Squad, could you sell Ryan Grubb? The idea of being the next head coach upon Kirk Ferentz's retirement, is that a big enough bargaining chip plus a lot of cash? I've given that some thought, and first of all, I don't have any reason to think that Ryan Grubb um, is even remotely in the conversation. I think he's too big of a name right now. I don't know what types of offers he's getting, if any. I'm guessing he has some opportunities to coach. At, at, to be a head coach at the Power 5 level this year, and right then and there, any Power 5 head coaching position, to me, is better than a Power 5 uh, Iowa offensive coordinator position where he potentially is the head coach in waiting in two or three years. I don't think that Iowa can make a promise to a guy who has not done this at the Big Ten level yet. Now, he's ran a lot of great stuff out of Washington, but how will that translate? We don't know. Um, certainly, that was a dynamic offense out there this year behind Michael Penix and company. But I don't think if you're Iowa, you can absolutely guarantee, hey, you're the next head coach when Kirk retires. So if Ryan Grubb's got an opportunity to go coach at you know, Indiana um, or at even at a Vanderbilt or I'm trying to think of schools that that have openings, um, you know, I, I think you probably take those jobs. I also think those jobs pay more. Like, what's the head coach of uh, Vanderbilt making? That'd be a great, a good question. Uh, head coach of Vanderbilt, because even if I was able to pay, um, let me, let me look up Clark Lee's salary. Uh, even if, if uh, I was able to pay $2 million to match what Grubb's making Lee, uh, according to what I'm seeing here, um, he's making almost $4 million annually. Now, if he's the head coach in waiting, is it worth waiting a few years making 2 million? coaching the Iowa offense, taking over a really stable program as opposed to making $4 million at a very vulnerable place like Vanderbilt. Those are the pros and cons that you weigh. I would have a hard time imagining Kirk Ferentz putting that much effort and Iowa putting that much effort into it. Also, Kirk Ferentz is not the guy who is going to be naming the next head coach. So he is the guy responsible for naming the next offensive coordinator. So how would that work logistically? If you brought in Ryan Grubb for an interview and, and Grubb's like, hey, why would I come here, make the same amount when I can, you know, I'm I'm in a great place right now at Washington. This offense is thriving. I'm making $2 million a year, and I've got offers from Vandy from wherever else, assuming he does have offers somewhere. What is Kirk going to say? Well, we'll hand you the job when when I retire. He can't say that. So that would, I, I don't think those are conversations are happening, but that has been tossed out there, and I guess it's a fair conversation to have. Um. Tyler says starting safety and starting cornerback along with their best edge rusher and top two of the running backs are out for sure. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, I'll be doing a little bit more research before our preview. By the way, if anybody missed this, I announced it last night in the show. I'll be doing a live show, Hawkeye Hangout live show with Coach Don Patterson tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Stay tuned. I'll announce uh, start time for that here in the next 12 hours or so. 
Wednesday night, myself and Coach John Patterson talking to uh, Hawkeye fans everywhere over on my channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Erica says we need to put Marco Linez in. Tennessee will not be prepared for him. Will not be prepared. I, I agree. Uh, there's lots of reason to audition Marco Linez. The one thing that I wonder about, though, Erica, is if I was willing to be uncomfortable during an opportunity to get that 11th win. I think Kirk really values the opportunity to get 11 wins, and I'm not saying he's wrong for that, but uh, if he hasn't been willing to put in Marco Linez during the regular season when Deacon was struggling, when you know you have games of equal importance, if he views this game as equally as important as I, I think a lot of fans do not view the bowl game as equally as important, but I think Kirk does, an opportunity to get to 11 wins, etc., does he go with an uncomfortable selection? Now, the one thing we don't know, Erica, is how has Marco Alainez looked during bowl prep? Could he have convinced Kirk Ferentz that uh, he's ready for the moment during bowl prep? Because obviously he had not convinced him up until the bowl announcement. I actually asked Kirk Ferentz during the bowl game announcement press conference, hey, you know, you, you, uh, you're willing to put in Marshall Meter when Drew Stevens is struggling in a game. Why can't we see, why don't we see anybody else at quarterback when your quarterback is struggling? I think it's a fair question. Kirk said, hey, we have not seen it in practice. And he's going to double down on that. I give him credit for being consistent with his take, with his stance. Uh, his feeling on the kicking position is that Marshall Meter had shown something in practice. I'm not there every day in practice, so I can't argue that. But apparently Marshall Meter has shown more to be able to compete more at his respective position in a real game than Marco Linez has at his position. That's the argument I think that Kirk Ferentz is making. By the way, um, because Mark is not here, why don't we do this? Uh, I'm going to mix things up a little bit. Uh, we got about uh, 20 minutes or so. If you want to call in, feel free to call in. I'll actually throw the link up here in the chat. We'll probably keep the calls relatively short if there's anybody that wants to chat, but they can do that. Go ahead and uh, jump in on StreamYard if you have some time. Iowa Farmer Blake, give me a top 100 offense and an 8-4 and four record these next couple of years. I'd be more than happy and interested to watch Iowa than this year's 10, possibly 11 win year. Okay. I mean, do I, I don't want to say, you know, potato, potato, uh, or, you know, six of one half dozen of another, but what's the difference between, I understand from an entertainment standpoint, having a more entertaining offense, I get that line of reasoning. Now, if you're just looking at record, like what's the difference between eight and four against a much more difficult schedule next year versus 10 and two, with a less difficult schedule this year, there may not be any difference as far as, you know, this team, this exact team on next year's schedule, you know, do they go, you know, eight and four, I would guess probably seven and five or eight and four, probably more so towards seven and five. That's a fair question to ask. And, you know, um, I understand from an entertainment standpoint, offense sells, right. And that's one of the problems because this is an entertainment business. LH, thank you for the uh, uh, well wishes. Appreciate that. Uh, we are entering a new year, and uh, so lots of good content on the way over at the channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm and right here, Iowa football at the voice of college football. Um, LH says that if Iowa starts to tank, the well, last time we faced uh, the Vols, then Marco is in. Boy, if Iowa tanks, that, that's a bad sign for the defense because – uh, first of all, this defense is a lot better than the defense that lost to Tennessee in the Insight Bowl or TaxLayer.com Bowl, whatever that was back in 2014. I don't think that's going to happen. I think, if anything, we're going to see a close game. They may give up some points because Virginia, or excuse me, Tennessee understands um, how to make big plays. Um, they are very good at uh, creating... Uh, well, I'll say this. I have not watched them on tape to say that definitively yet, but from what I understand they are not very good at limiting penalties. Iowa is very good at limiting penalties. So I guess my point is um, Iowa is more likely to capitalize on mistakes than Tennessee will be. And, you know, that means a lot, I think, in a game that's close. We, we've seen that play out how many times with Iowa. So uh, even though the Vols can score, they can go up and down the field. Iowa has shown itself really well against every offense that it's faced this year, namely Michigan. Even Penn State, go back and watch that game. I think it was 10-0 at halftime. Yes, I understand it. It'd be on 31-0. The offense was a total disaster. Defense play, it's, it's butt off. That's basically what Phil Parker's guys do each and every game, even when the offense does absolutely nothing. Score doesn't always represent that because 
uh, it is hard. It is hard to have guys on the field for 90 plays, right? Um, but, boy, the defense was good against Michigan here a couple of weeks ago. Can you believe that it's been actually over three weeks since the Big Ten Championship game? So I felt like it was just in Indianapolis just a few days ago. Um, Steve says he's going to be in Orlando. Uh, 22nd row in Orlando, and it's an ideal place to catch a Deacon Hill pass. That's mean, Steve. Mean. But uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for going out of the game. I, I won't be making it to the game. I think it's fair to say that. I'm not making it down to Orlando. I'd love to be down there right now, given the weather. It's not been bad here in Iowa. If you're in Iowa, folks, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. We're going to escape December with minimal winter damage. I saw it was snowing today. Very little snow, though, on the ground. It's been uh, unseasonably warm, and um, I'll take it any day of the week. Hawkeye Howard, thank you for being here, Hawkeye Howard. Um, I did throw the live chat link up in the, um, or the stream yard link, I should say up in the live chat. I'll throw it back up there again. And, um, a reminder that if you have not yet subscribed to the voice of college football, be sure to do that. Mark is doing uh, great stuff. You can also uh, sponsor his content over at, uh, either his main channel where he covers the sport like none other over at the Voice of College Football, or right here, our Iowa channel, we are constantly looking for new opportunities, new sponsorship opportunities. And as we head into the offseason, there's going to be lots of great shows ahead. Um, of course, we still have football to talk about for now, but uh, um, there's so many debates to have, so much great content. We bring in special guests. Mark does a great job scheduling people here in the channel. Uh, be sure to reach out to him, TV at gmail.com, TV at gmail.com, if you're interested in sponsorship opportunities. Uh, also, you can follow Mark Rogers over at the Voice of College Football. Um, again, uh, there's not a better follow out there as it relates to the sport. Give him a follow and give me a follow. I'm at from the Hawkeye on Twitter and Instagram. At from the Hawkeye Twitter and Instagram. Also from the Hawkeye of the Storm on Facebook. Um, this is Iowa Hawkeyes Live 126. I'm writing solo today. Grant Williams says, uh, Paul Christ or Joe Philbin? I'm guessing the question is who is more likely to get the job? And this is me not reporting anything official from anyone. I want to make sure I draw the line in the sand based on what I believe Paul Christ is more likely to get the job than Joe Philbin. But that is, uh, I'm not reporting anything. Uh, don't go repeating that Corey. Corey says that Paul Christ is set to get the job. I think you're asking who's more likely to get the job in my opinion. Paul Christ or Joe Philbin, based on what I know, Paul Christ is the, uh, I think he's a better candidate, frankly. I, I think he's the better hire. I like Joe Philbin. I got a lot of respect for what Joe Philbin, Philbin has done. His track record, he's got a really good resume, has been a, a Super Bowl winning offensive coordinator, has uh, you know, called plays briefly up there, although was not the play caller during the majority of his time in Green Bay, went on to be the head coach at Miami. Um, he coached O-line here. Iowa needs help with the O-line, but I think Iowa really needs help with the passing game. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But I think if anything, um, you know, you're going to see an opportunity at a, a guy who understands the pass offense, whether it's Philbin or Chris. I think Chris is a better candidate. He's a former quarterbacks coach, former play caller, former quarterback himself, whereas Joe Philbin is an O-line guy. David says, is Luke Lachey going to play in the bowl game? The answer to that question is no, unfortunately. But I do think it's a good opportunity, good chance that Luke comes back. All right. Now, I, I, with everything, I want to let these kids make their announcements. So I am not saying anything based on scuttlebutt or what I've been told. But from an indication standpoint, I think we got a good chance of getting Luke Lachey back. And uh, that would be phenomenal for this program and for the offense. Man, he was good before he went down. I know the offense didn't look great, but he was so good those first few games with Cade McNamara. And bring him back against, uh, along with Addison Estringa. Um, you know, and then these young guys will have another year to, to uh, progress. I was just so reliable, so consistent and balanced with, um, the, uh, the tight end position. Uh, Steve says, Hey Corey, if I do catch a ball, I want Deacon and you to sign it. All right. I will give you my PO box number, Steve, you get Deacon signature. I'll sign it as well. And, uh, you can put it up in your display box. I'm sure it'll be worth a lot of money someday. Uh, boy, Sam Laporta has been really good, hasn't he? Uh, 
LH brings this up in the chat. Uh, he has been a difference maker for Detroit. Like I said, my heart goes out to TJ Hawkinson because he's had a really good year as well. He's actually um, had more yards than uh, Sam Laporta. Sam Laporta has been a red zone dog. I mean, he has been incredible as a rookie. Very hard to do that as a rookie, and he's been phenomenal. Um, here's a concern. Uh, Paul Christ, how long would he stay? That is valid reason for concern, but I don't know how old Paul Christ is compared to Joe Philbin. How much longer does Kirk Ferentz have here? That's a question. I think longevity-wise, you, you may wonder that. However, do we know Paul Christ wants to be a head coach again? Um, there have been talks about uh, him and interest from Northwestern. Of course, Northwestern's got their guy now, but when Pat Fitzgerald was relieved of his duties, there was kind of some scuttle about Paul Chris potentially going to Northwestern. Um, so, you know, that's a question mark, but um, I understand your perspective. I think Iowa needs to think about here and now. I understand college football is a lot about recruiting, but oh, you, you see coordinators jumping around all over the place. That's just the nature of football. And some of the best programs are switching offensive coordinators and defensive coaches because, hey, these guys end up you know, developing into great coaches. They get head coaching opportunities. Look at how many guys have left the Alabama staff. And I understand that's one example and maybe kind of an outlier, but I don't think you can, I think you need to get the best position, best person available, not the best person who's not going to be stolen by someone else. Because if Paul Christ, it does a good enough job at Iowa in two years to get some decent head coaching jobs that trump the Iowa position. Hire him for two years, and then we'll worry after that. To me, those two years would be invaluable, but I do understand the perspective. Um, let's see here if I'm missing anybody else here in the chat, and I'll uh, I'll call last play or last call on our uh, call line if you want to call in. I'll throw it one more time up here in the chat if you got a question or a comment regarding anything Iowa Hawkeye related. And keep in mind, myself and Coach Patterson, I guess I should make a banner for that. Myself and Coach Patterson will be live tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. Central. In fact, let me uh, let me go ahead and uh, put that on a banner so it's official for everybody. Uh, myself and Coach Don Patterson talking Iowa and Tennessee in the Citrus Bowl tomorrow at 7 30 p.m over at uh, from the hawkeye of the storm um just typing this in here so bear with me uh, i'll throw it up here on the screen so everybody can see it if you're if you're listening via spotify or one of our podcast platforms uh, be sure to uh, tune in tomorrow to the live show again 7 30 p.m central time uh on Wednesday. So Wednesday, that's December 26th, or excuse me, 27th. Heading all this on the fly here. So I apologize for not having done that uh, in advance. But uh, here is our banner. I think all this is accurate. Hawkeye Hangout featuring myself and Coach Don Patterson tomorrow. That's Wednesday, December 27th at 7 30 p.m. from the Hawkeye of the Storm on YouTube. And uh, we'll probably go for two. We usually, Coach Patterson and I, man, we get to talking, get to talking with our callers. We'll probably go for at least two hours. So I would say at least 7.30 to 9.30 should be a fun, fun time. Our last live show of the year. We'll have, of course, a post-game show after the Citrus Bowl next Monday, but this will be our last live show of the year. So if you came here today uh, expecting, I know our, our, I guess we should change our title, but if you came here expecting a, Citrus Bowl preview. You've got just basically a bunch of banter about the offensive coordinator position and uh, some guys that will be playing will not be playing for Iowa. But tomorrow we'll be breaking it all down. And Coach Patterson has some analytics to share with us. He's already shared a buttload of analytics with Kirk Ferentz and company. They just got down to Orlando, I believe, this afternoon. So we'll have plenty to talk about tomorrow evening and we'll get your questions, get your comments, your two cents. And I'm sure we'll divert into some offensive coordinator talk as well. Um, that's just kind of what we do this time of year, especially given the situation. It is somewhat opinion. Uh, or excuse uh, Man, I, 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 it feels like a three-hour show. I'm already mumbling and bumbling. Uh, it is somewhat um, difficult this time of year not to talk about it because it's an unprecedented situation. Iowa's only hired three offensive coordinators since Kirk has been here. So, you know, this will be number four and coming on the heels of historically bad offenses. It's understandable. So Hawkeye hangout tomorrow, 7.30 p.m. Central time. 
Uh, Alan wants to know what the percentage is uh, of Cooper DeGene returning. Um, I wish I could answer that, Alan. I, I, I can't answer that. Um, do I have an opinion? You know, maybe, but as I've said before, I'm going to let all these kids answer that question by way of their announcement. I think it'd be totally unfair to speculate, but, um, I think you should stay tuned to the announcement. I'll just say that. Uh, Steve says, uh, do you think coach Patterson has an opinion on OC? I think he probably does. I've talked to him a little bit. I talked to him yesterday and he shared some, some thoughts, but, uh, be a great piece of conversation. We'll have plenty of time to talk about it tomorrow evening, uh, during our live show. Um, I see an early prediction here from our uh, user. I don't even pronounce your name. I, I ask this every time. Tlatoini, Tlatoani, um, seventeen ten Iowa over Tennessee. Boy, that'd be a, a phenomenal, phenomenal defensive performance if they can hold this Vols team to ten. But I would not count this defense and Phil Parker's unit out at any point. Again, tomorrow night, folks, myself and Coach Don Patterson talking uh, Iowa and Tennessee in the Citrus Bowl. Join me. Uh, join us 7 30 p.m central time from the hawkeye of the storm on youtube have a great tuesday folks enjoy some college football we'll talk to you tomorrow